Today we're going to talk about linear regression. This is going to be hopefully a refresher for most of you if you have seen this before. Um, and otherwise, hopefully an introduction to the rest of you that haven't seen this yet. Um, there's more to this than I'll be able to cover as usual. So uh, I invite you to check out these two books, which should be shared with you or otherwise freely available on the internet. Um, I'm gonna use material from these in today's lecture, uh, and they're also useful introductory reads on the topic. The reason I'm talking about regression today is because it's one of these super fundamental mechanisms for testing hypotheses in empirical science in general. And you know, there's gonna be a million flavors of regression. We're gonna talk about the simplest one today, but if you understand this well, you'll be able to pick up any of the other ones on your own afterwards when you encounter them. There's sort of one of these, you know, building foundational blocks that will serve you uh, in all of your future data analyses. Okay. All right, so let me start with a case study. Let's say we have some data. This is, so we have so three media through which we've been advertising, I don't know, maybe political ads for political campaigns, what have you, uh, TV ads, radio ads, and newspaper ads. And we've spent, uh, you see on the Y axis, how much uh, we've sold of some product. Also, it's not political ads, it's something else. How much we've sold of some products, the new iPhone 14 Pro. Um, as a function of how much we spent on advertising through these different media, okay? Uh, in some 200 cities where we collected this data. So you can roughly see that, you know, in general, it seems like the more, you know, the more you spend on advertising, the more you sell, right? That's roughly what we're seeing. There's some, you know, it varies a bit, but roughly there's some correlation between how much you spend on advertising in each of the three media and how many iPhones you end up selling. Okay. Right. Um, so, you know, when you have uh, data like this, there's a few questions that you might want to address, and these map to research questions that you might want to ask in a you know research study that uh, uses similar data. For example, is there a relationship between advertising budget and sales? Is an obvious kind of question that you might ask yourselves when uh, faced with such data. How strong is the relationship? Not just that there is one, but you know, can you quantify its strength? Which of the three media contributes the most to sales? You know, could you disentangle them? Or how accurately can you estimate the effect of each medium on sales? So this is again about disentangling the three. Uh, maybe you wanna predict future sales based on current uh, advertising expenditure, Maybe you want to test if the relationship is linear or follow some other shape. Uh, maybe you want to see if there's some synergy among the advertising media. You know, maybe it helps to uh, advertise on radio and TV at the same time, but you know, maybe newspapers don't add much to either one of those two things. You know, so you, know, you might want to study this to prioritize where you're going to spend your advertising budget. Okay. So you can see how these map very naturally to you know, kinds of questions that you might ask about variables of interest in your particular research studies. Okay, so we are going to be using this mechanism of simple linear regression to answer questions like these. And I'm gonna argue that this is a great mechanism to do this. But just to remind you, um, let's say you have a set of points, you know, an X and a Y, uh, and these are some observations that you've collected empirically from somewhere. Um, so you're looking to estimate a simple linear regression line that best summarizes or describes these points or the relationship between them. Okay. So you remember this from, I don't know, algebra? Where did, where did people study, I don't know, lines and points? Statistics. Okay, you might remember from somewhere that you know when you have uh, you know a line 
you, if you want to describe the relationship between an X and a Y, you need two parameters. I'm going to call these beta zero and beta one. So the you know, line, regression line going through this cloud of points is represented by that equation over there, you know, Y equals beta zero plus beta one times X. Now the catch is there's multiple, quite many, right? Possible linear models that summarize the observations we have collected, right? All of these lines conform to this equation, right? They're all lines of, they're all lines, right? Any line conforms to this equation. Um, so, you know, there's lots of possible linear models that you could estimate summarizing your observations. Um, so, you know, what's the best one? Well, the best one is maybe the one that minimizes the error between the model expected outcome at some value of X and the actual observed value of X. So that's the idea. Um, and we're gonna talk about residuals as a way of studying this error. So here, you know, uh, let's say I've estimated that line that's represented there in the plot. Um, and the dots are the individual observations that we start with. Now, you know, you can see how the line does not go through all of the points, you know, because the points are not collinear, right? So at every value of X, you know, there's some error between what we estimate the value of Y to be based on this equation and what the actual observed value of Y is. And okay? we're gonna call those residuals. That's the difference between the observed and the estimated, the predicted. Okay. Um, all right. So the people do this using uh, least squares uh, regression typically. So here uh, you're basically minimizing the sum of the squared errors between the observed and the estimated. And this is a way of estimating this regression line. Why do we do squared errors? Does anybody know? As opposed to just errors? That way it doesn't matter if they're positive or negative. That's it. That's the trick. Thanks, Courtney. Why do you do absolute value? I don't know. It's a good question. Why don't you do absolute value? It's bad. It's like, it doesn't turn out right. They showed us in like my stats two class. It doesn't work. You can do it, but it is bad. It's not as effective. So Courtney will explain to you offline why that is. Can I put you on the spot, Courtney? Well, no, no, right. not at all. Uh, okay, good. Courtney will not explain offline. You, you will find this out on your own and let me know next time. But yeah, that's a good question. Okay, so yeah, let's say, you know, sales as a function of TV advertising and you get some uh, estimates of these coefficients. Fasu says, I thought it's because squared error has a clean closed form solution. You can differentiate squares, but not absolute values. That makes sense. Stats, that's just oh. Vasu, you have redeemed yourself. <laughs> cool. All right. Um, so now, how do you know, you know how good your estimate is? Well, let's say you have some true relationship between this, these variables. And let's say the true relationship, the one that you don't actually observe, is this one, you know, your y as a function of x is 3x plus 2. That's the true relationship between these variables. And you have some observations, you know, there's some noise in your measurements and whatnot that distorts the values a little bit. And you draw some observations and they're not quite all, you know, fitting this line perfectly. Um, so you have some least squares estimate for uh, this uh, relationship based on the observed data, you know, that's not quite the uh, true relationship. Okay. So um, this is where you will see this epsilon term uh, describing the error term, whatever is left, right? So you, know, you can always 
uh, represent your uh, values of y uh, as uh, you know, this estimates uh, estimated regression line as a function of x plus whatever's left over the error term the residuals okay. um, and you know let's say you know you take so you've, you've estimated this regression line you've estimated some coefficients based on some sample you know let's say you draw a different sample next time from the same uh, population uh, and you compute a new regression estimate and you know you get a slightly different line because your points are going to be slightly different and so on and so forth you keep doing this so the idea is that you know the average of these many lines that you estimate by taking many random samples from this population that you don't actually have access to entirely that average of all of these estimated regression lines is probably going to be pretty close to the true population regression line which you don't observe and yeah you know, this is for the same reasons if you remember this um when you're estimating the population mean of some random variable you're doing the same trick right? so there the question is how accurately is this mean of your sample uh, mu with a hat on it uh, as an estimate of the true mean mu without a hat on it of the population you don't actually observe uh, and you talk about standard errors in that context if you might remember this so standard errors they are used to compute confidence intervals and let's say in, you have a 95 percent confidence interval that means that it's defined as the range of values such that nine with 95 percent probability the range will contain the true unknown value of that population mean so if i draw you know a new random sample from this population and compute the mean right 95 times out of 100 this random sample will contain the actual unobserved true mean. That's sort of the idea. So it's a way of telling you how uh, you know, far off you are from the true mean. So in a similar fashion, you will see that people do this with these linear regression uh, coefficient estimates. Right? You talk about standard errors of these coefficients, and you talk about confidence intervals for these coefficients. And it's the same idea that you've maybe seen before with sample means. So, you know, this coefficient estimate, uh, the uh, confidence interval for it uh, takes approximately this form. Like you have a coefficient estimate plus or minus uh, two standard errors of that coefficient. And so, more concretely, so here's an example, you know, back to our uh, sales advertising example the beta zero coefficient here has a 95 confidence 95 percent confidence interval of six point something to 7.9 okay so you can see there we go so on the so beta zero is the intercept we call that the intercept that's the value of y when x equals zero okay so you can see that you know, 95% of the time, it's between six and some change and almost eight. That makes sense, okay, based on what I'm showing you here. And then similarly, the slope coefficient beta one is between, you know, whatever that is, 0 0.04 and 0 0.05. Okay. So the way to you interpret these is the following. In the absence of any advertising for x equals zero, uh, on average, sales will fall somewhere between, you know, 6.1 and 7.9 units of whatever this is. Okay. Uh, and then for every unit increase in TV advertising, for, for every unit increase in your X variable, there will be an average increase in your outcome sales uh, between say 42 and 53 units. Uh, so this 42 to 53 comes from a thousand times the estimated coefficient here. That's where the value comes from. So I could have done this with just the actual value of the coefficient and said, you know, for every unit of uh, increase in TV advertising, 
the sales go up by 0 0.04, between 0 0.04 and 0 0.05 units of whatever. But this is easier to read. Okay. Yes. So just to clarify, because I was looking at this like intuitively, it seems like you can fit them all. It says, you know, if it's if you have a lower number of uh um wait, what's the actual ID? Is it like number of ads? Uh probably, yeah. yeah. So it's like if you have less money spent then there's lower like variance, and if you have more money spent, there's higher variance, right? So like you might want to put like two lines that would be um, like this is this line is going to give you like roughly like a lower bound and then this might give you like a common bound. So these like 95% confidence intervals for one band zero, they're not doing that right. They're not like giving you lines that are going to approximate the shape of this distribution, right? Like they would both have roughly like similar slopes rather than like trying to account for the spread of the distribution. Right? I think they are, right? Because they have different slopes. So what, what would they look like on? That's a good question. I don't. I would have a hard time drawing them by hand. But but you know they have uh, they have different intercept and different slope. So you can imagine, you know, take the lower of the intercepts, you know, with the higher of the slopes. Take the higher of the intercepts with the lower of the slopes, and you get this, you know, cone. So you can imagine that that might actually be much closer to what you're describing. I don't actually have them here for but this. It, but in general, like by computing these 95% common intervals, confidence intervals for the coefficients, that's not explicitly what you're doing. Even though it might look similar, you're not explicitly trying to like get this like model of range, right? I, I'm not explicitly trying to account for the fact that there's higher variance in higher values of X. No. I'm not explicitly doing that. And I will come back to this a little later. Um, but no, I, I'm not doing that. This is, I mean, there's other things you can argue here. You could argue that maybe, you know, there's also some of a non-linearity in this relationship visually, you know, so maybe a simple linear model is not the best approximation of this data set. You could argue that too, right? So you could argue all of these, I'm leaving all of them aside uh, because I'm talking about the simplest possible thing here, which is just a simple linear model. Uh, but I agree, right? That's not probably sufficient. Okay. Okay. All right. So here's the million dollar, billion dollar idea. Okay. You ready? Ready to have your minds blown? Okay. So these standard errors can also be used to perform hypothesis tests on the coefficients, as it turns out. So effectively, you could test the null hypothesis that there is no relationship between your X and your Y versus the alternative hypothesis that there is some relationship between your X and Y, okay? And that is equivalent to testing whether these co estimated coefficients are significantly different from zero or not. And you know, let's say there's some, I don't know, T statistic you calculate an associated P value that gives you some confidence in how different from zero uh, the estimated coefficient is, right? So that's what happens internally when you estimate a regression model. Uh, and we're not gonna talk about how that happens. You can read about this uh, separately. But that's the million dollar idea. Okay? The million dollar idea is you can test for presence or absence of correlations between variables by testing whether these estimated coefficients are significantly different from zero, which you get for free with a, you know, a model estimate in your favorite statistical package R. Okay? Because, you know, because if there isn't, right? If if say this beta 1 coefficient estimate is not significantly different from 0, then it means that whatever value of x you plug in, the value of y will not change. 
which means there is no relationship between X and Y because Y does not vary with X. Sam? Um, is it, is, are you just talking about linear relationships? Like if you have like a distribution with a parabola, right? Linear, li we're talking linear model, yes. But, so, but, so that's not a constant system, there's no relationship, there's no, there's no linear relationship. Correct, yes. Yes, thank you, that's, that is correct. Uh, fundamentally, the principle carries over to other forms of relationships. The, the principle holds, but yes, the example is it's about linear. Make sense? This is the million dollar idea. Okay. If there's a correlation between them, it means they co-vary. It means if you change X, Y also changes, right? And the only way that happens is if this slope coefficient beta one in our example is different from zero. If it is not different from zero, it won't matter what you plug into X, Y will always be the same. Meaning there, it does not vary with X, okay? Billion dollar idea. Now, right, so I mentioned this, you get this for free in your favorite statistical uh, software R. Uh, so, you know, this T statistic and P values and whatnot, standard errors of coefficients, coefficient estimates, you get for free, this is standard output of any, uh, you know, any statistical software gives you this as standard output. Um, and you would interpret this in the same way. You say, you know, an increase of $1,000 in TV advertising, they're looking at this coefficient here, uh, is associated with an increase in sales of these many units times 1,000. It's always, you know, one unit increase in TV, gives you 0 0.04 units increase in uh, sales. What, you, know, you have the standard error, so the 95% confidence interval is gonna be you know, the estimated coefficient plus or minus two of these standard errors. Okay. All of the stuff that we need, you get for free in any of these statistical software. Okay, All right. So you know, here's another example. This is what the actual R output looks like. So you have some points there on the right-hand side at the top and X and Y. Uh, and I'm showing you, let me walk you through this. So I'm showing you uh, LM stands for linear model. That's the API call you're using. Uh, and you're saying you know, formula equals y1 tilde x1 so y1 as a function of x1 you know estimates the coefficients for that linear relationship given this particular data set that's a table some data frame that you plug in um, and you get this output here okay so this tells you uh, what the coefficient estimates are for intercept and for x1 okay, so intercept is the value of y when x equals zero Okay, and the estimate of that is three. So you see that here. Okay, doesn't quite look like three, but you know that's what the model estimated. Okay. And then the slope estimate is 0.5. So your equation would be, you know, y equals uh, three plus 0.5 times x. That makes sense? And then you have your standard errors, whatever T statistics, and you have some p-value that tells you what? What does it tell you? Not a trick question. We talked about it a minute ago on the previous slide. What does the p-value tell you? Matt. It is not. P value? We are close. P value is the thing we talked about a lot last Tuesday. But in this context, what does it tell you? It's the probability of a type 2A. No, type 1. Right. So it tells you, yeah, yes. Um, here specifically, it tells you uh, if this coefficient estimate is to be trusted as statistically significantly different from zero or not. Okay. 
So the null hypothesis is that the estimate is zero. And you know you get a small p value. If you get a small p value, you reject the null hypothesis, meaning the estimate is statistically significantly different from zero, meaning there's some relationship you know, between that variable and the outcome. So you can see that for both of these at the usual magic threshold of 5%, right, both of these are below the magic threshold of 5%, okay? So therefore both of these coefficients, you can believe that they are statistically significantly different from zero. Therefore, you know, this relationship, y as a function of x, is in this case described as so y equals three plus 0.5 times x. Does that make sense? Sam. So I why do we care about the value of the Why do we care? The intercept may have a experimentally meaningful thing. Like what what is the value at zero when x is zero? Um, so yeah. If it's future performance based on past grades, that will tell you whether their expected future performance if the grade is zero versus the percent. Mm -hmm. So otherwise you can't, if it's the P value is above 0 0.05, I guess you can't include any P value. Yeah. So I was wondering, I'm thinking, you know, are the examples where you don't get this, do you not always get it to be different from zero? Is it sometimes zero? Is the intercept sometimes zero? I suppose it could be. It could just go be a perfect diagonal, right? Yeah. 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 So that just tells you there's a right. It does not go through the perfect diagonal. It does not go through zero. There's some non-zero value. Yep. Okay. I I believe that. Okay, the other things you get for free are uh, some uh, R squared value, which is some measure of how well the, uh, the data you observed fits this model you estimated. And this is some value between zero and one and higher is better in general. Okay. Uh, and anyway, so there's a lot more to this, but that's roughly the idea. Now, depending on the class of model, you know, for linear models, you get this true R squared value. With other kinds of models, you get other flavors, you know, other approximations of this R squared value. The point is, for any model you estimate, there's some measure of goodness of fit that tells you, you know, how well does the model uh, model the data you've observed. Um, and you know, there's there's some version of this that you can always compute depending on whatever class of model you're using. But the idea is, you know, higher is better, and you can use this to compare models. Okay. Okay. So let's make this a little bit more realistic now. Let's say we want to extend this analysis to accommodate all of the predictors. We talked about TV, radio, and newspapers. And we're advertising through th uh, three different media. Um, and now we wanna study, you know, we wanna study all of these, the effects of all of these, or model that. Um, so one option would be to do this pairwise, right? We just talked about a simple linear model that uh, looks at the correlation between TV advertising and sales. Right, that was the one we just talked about. We could do the same thing too, right? We could do, you know, radio advertising versus sales, and we could do newspaper advertising versus sales. And, you know, for each of these, we get some estimates of coefficients and, you know, some associated p values. And we could tell whether or not there's some relationship, some correlation between. Uh, you know, say radio advertising and sales, 
newspaper advertising and sales and TV advertising and sales. Okay, we could do, we could do this. Um, if, again, like looking at this last column with key values, looking at this all the way down, if you look at this and I'm asking you to interpret this, to conclude, you know, is there a relationship between these different advertising channels and sales? What would you say? Is there, in general, for each of them, you know, is there a relationship? And for, is there a relationship for all three of them? Is what I'm asking. Or none of them, or some subset of them. Not, not a trick question. How do we read this? Somebody over Zoom or over Room? Anybody? Vasu says yes. Jenny says, I think there's a relationship for all of them. Why, Jenny? Um, because the coefficients are more than one, and then the p values are also less than one ten thousand. Right. So there's this magic threshold again, the five percent magic threshold, and all of these p values are you know well below the five percent magic threshold. Therefore, you know, for each of these, you reject the null hypothesis. You know, therefore, all of those coefficient estimates are statistically significantly different from zero. Therefore, there's a relationship between all three of these channels and sales. Yes? I might say association. Association. I mean, if it was, is it a true experiment? I mean, associate. I, <laughs> I said relationship or correlation. I didn't say causal. I, I never said causal. So, so association is fine. That's that's a good term to use. I agree with that. Okay, right. So you could do that, but I'm going to argue a better option is to not do that. I was talking to Jenny about this on Tuesday. Um, a better option is actually to give each predictor a different slope coefficient in a single model to model them all together. So here, you know, instead of doing three separate regressions, I do only one with a separate slope coefficient for the three different advertising channels. Okay, one for TV, one for radio, one for newspapers. And the reason I'm doing this is because these things probably happen concurrently. You know, there's ads playing on the radio while there's ads playing on tv and you know while there's ads you know happening in the newspapers being published in the newspapers and so on so th these are not so you know um, uh, separate completely separate kinds of uh, channels right that you know there's probably some mixing of the effects that these might have on sales right you know you don't quite know if sales were due to advertising through tv or radio or you know if you advertise on tv and radio at the same time do you get more sales you know maybe just a multiplier effect because there's more chance of the same person hearing or seeing that ad right you know maybe i listen to the radio on my commute to work you know in the morning and in the afternoon but maybe i watch tv in the evening so you know there's more opportunity to get exposed to the ad, maybe this might increase sales, et cetera. I can't capture any of this, anything that happens, you know, between and within these different channels if I model them separately. Whereas we could talk about how I might model that jointly and we're gonna do that, okay? So now this is back to the million dollar idea, okay? Um, each of these coefficient estimates, these betas, is interpreted as the average effect on the outcome of one unit increase in, in the respective predictor value variable, sorry, holding all other predictors fixed. This is the billion dollar idea. Okay. Right? So this is it's obvious why, you know, because you know, to to get an 
you to, yeah, so anyway. Do you get the point here that these coefficient estimates assume that everything else stays constant? That's how they're computed. And you could see, you could you know work out the uh, uh, the math to convince yourself of this if you don't believe me. Okay. So that why is this a billion dollar idea? Why? Why am I so excited about this? And no, I did not have eat unique for lunch. <laughs> I had Orient Express. Thank you very much. Jenny says, because I can make stronger claims about my data. Yes, but, but why? Why are they stronger? B billion dollar idea, seriously. Okay, Jenny has it over Zoom chat, but since you're none of you are on are on Zoom chat, I'm not going to spoil it. I don't know. Some weeks ago, we started talking about causal relationships, and I said that there's one of these things that you know you must remember forever about causal relationships. There are three ingredients to establishing causality. What what were they? What are the properties of the cause and the effect, the three properties that must hold for there to be a causal relationship? The absence of the effect in the absence of the cause. There's a relationship, yes, that's one. There's a, they're associated mm -hmm. quantitatively, yes, they co vary. That's one. What else? Temporal precedence. precedence. What's the third one? That's right. You exclude plausible alternative explanations, right? Three ingredients to causal relationships. Okay. Think about this for a second, right? Ideally, we almost have two of the three here. Okay. Because, because if I model plausible alternative explanations jointly, When I interpret the code, say TV is the thing I really care about. If I model plausible alternative explanations, radio and newspaper jointly, right? The coefficient estimate for TV is immune to variation in radio and newspaper advertising. So it kind of does this, it kind of does the third thing, right? It accounts for plausible alternative explanations, you know, radio and TV, sorry, radio and newspaper advertising, it holds those constant. And it reasons about the association between TV advertising and sales, irrespective of those other two. Okay? So it, do, it does this third thing, kind of. So you, you're gonna argue, and I see Sam already like, you know, fuming over this, or like, no, but like, how do you know it's all of them? And you know, what if there's some that you haven't modeled, blah, 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 right? Okay, so you know, you could be Sam. I agree with you, Sam. <laughs> I agree with Sam, right? I agree with Sam that you don't quite get this. It's not quite, but it's close. You know, it's as close as you can get with this framework, right? And so if you know, if you have a good theoretical understanding of the mechanism and plausible alternative explanations for the effect, you could include those in your model and you would be much more confident, you know, if, if there's a, a relationship between the thing you care about and the outcome, you'd be much more confident of its presence and strength with a joint model like this that, you know, controls effectively for other plausible alternative explanations, you can observe and model, not all of them, the ones you can observe and model. Okay? So you sort of get you know, the two of the three. Okay? So this is really why this joint modeling idea is the what I call a billion dollar idea, 
because it gets you much closer to causality, which is what you always want to show. Doesn't get you there, it gets you closer to there. That's not what I'm, that's what I'm saying, right? So I'm, I'm careful with what I'm saying, but it gets you closer than if you model these individually, like pairwise, you know, one at a time. Because then you have no idea about these alternative explanations, right? If I just model, you know, each of them in, individually, I have no grasp on what happens with the other ones. Okay. So actually, to prove this to you, here is the same example again. Um, on the left hand side, you have the same three models I showed you earlier. There was a coefficient estimate for these three uh, channels and they were all statistically significant. And okay. if you model them jointly, you will note that one of them goes away. That the effect of newspaper advertising disappears when you control for TV and radio. Okay. And, you know, by the way, these are so TV 0.04, TV 0.04, but the estimates are pretty close otherwise. Okay. But when you model for them jointly, you lose the effect of newspapers, which you would have mistakenly concluded is there if you had modeled them separately, independently. So this is an example for why this joint modeling approach is always better than the pairwise bivariate thing. Yes. I don't know how to represent four dimensions on a three dimensional universe unless by projecting. Yeah, the, the, the data there, like uh, try the book one of these. It's probably uh, available as an appendix or something. Whenever we were spending more on newspaper, we were also happy to be spending more on these other things. So it may appear that there was a relationship there, but that increase is attributable to the other uh, cross effects. That, that's fair. Yeah. So I... The absence of more TV and radio. This is not saying necessarily that newspaper is doing nothing. We're saying that newspaper success depends on. It's we don't have enough, we don't have we don't know because they also happened concurrently yeah. and from what we've observed, we can't conclude that, but we would say from what we observe, we would attribute the effect to the other two, not right. to newspaper. Yeah. yeah. Can you say attribute them to those strong underpinning causality? You got to be careful. Yeah. So what else did I keep saying to uh, ad nauseum by now? I, I must say this every class, I think, by now. Uh, you know, test the what, not the what. I have a catchphrase what is it test the dot 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 not the dot 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 
Yes, test the theory, not the tool. You gotta have a theory, right? So this is this is a test of a hypothesis that is derived from some theory that you have about the mechanism and the phenomenon and whatnot, right? And you're testing whether the data supports that you have a causal hypothesis. You, you don't have a causal uh, data analysis, but you have data that supports your causal hypothesis or not. Right? The data at most can tell you if there's a correlation right, with this flavor of analysis. I'm, I'm not claiming anything more than that, but the data can either support or not the causal hypothesis you have otherwise. It's still better than not knowing anything, right, about the phenomena. Because if it doesn't even support, if, you know, if there's no correlation, remember, per this, if there's no correlation, there's also going to be no causation. Right? So there has to be at least correlation. Right? Not all of it, but you, you need to have at least this, right, for there to be causality. You can't have causality without this. That makes sense? Yes. So what happens if you take like a data set and you have some dimensions? If you take one of the dimensions and you duplicate it, so you just end up with every point in the data set has two two columns on the same value. Yeah, I'll come back to this in a minute, probably. Okay. Yeah, thanks. This is great. I promise I have I have something on this. I'll show you. Anything more on this before we I want you to remember this, right? So it's one of these things that I promise you, I promise you. So th this, this fundamental idea will stick with you no matter what modeling framework, types of model, et cetera, you use. This idea of you know, hypothesis testing on coefficients and modeling jointly to control for covariates for other things will carry over to all kinds of models and whatnot. will stick with you forever. It's really useful. So if I ever see you submitting papers where you only do like bivariate things you know like one at a time with the outcome when you know that these things can influence each other and whatnot uh, you're gonna be in trouble i'm gonna be watching i'm gonna be watching i'm gonna be watching for your ICSI submissions and why not oh, try submissions whatever you'll be in trouble Okay. Jenny, I'm looking at you through, through the screen. Okay. Uh, okay, so now let's talk a little bit about interaction effects. So let's say, you know, we talked about the standard regression model with two variables, an X1 and an X2. Um, According to this model, if we increase x1 by one unit, then y will increase by an average of beta one units. Similarly, if we increase x2 by one unit, y will increase by an average of beta two units, right? That's just the interpretation of these coefficients. Um, so I can add what's called an interaction term in this model, which is literally the product of the two variables. Okay? So here, you know, I've, I've added this beta three x one times x two. That's the interaction term. Okay. Um, so you could see, for example, let's say, you know, another way of writing this is to reduce this to some form that looks more like the previous one. Okay. Except here, this beta one hat coefficient is a function of x2, varies with x2. But it's still fundamentally the same model as before, except the coefficient changes. It's not a constant, it's a function of the other variable. Okay, so if I change x2, that will change the impact of x1 on the outcome variable y. So do you remember what kinds of, we talked about two kinds of variables. When we talked about causal relationships way back when, we talked about two kinds of variables, uh, mediators and moderators. Does anybody remember that discussion? 
what does this sound like if any of those to you mediators or moderators I'm going to have Hangua put this on a quiz. Moderator, why? I'll give you a hint. It's on the screen. We defined moderator variables in exactly the same way uh, I'm, I'm describing this here on a, on a slide. Okay, so if you have, say, a moderator variable x2, right, that moderates the relationship between x1 and the outcome y, that means that depending on the value of this x2 variable, the strength of the relationship between x1 and y will change. Okay? So this is a way of modeling moderator variables with these so-called interaction terms in a simple linear regression model, or sorry, multiple linear regression model, not simple anymore. Okay, so here's what happens. Let's say we want to model credit card balance uh, using two variables, income is some numerical variable, and whether you're a student or not, a categorical variable. Okay, so you know you have your credit card balance, uh, and you express that as some intercept plus beta one times your income plus, you know, say beta two if you're a student or zero otherwise. Okay. So if I plot this, okay. if I show, if I plot this, um, you could see two regression lines here. Okay. If you're a student, that's the red line, the one on the top. If you're a non-student, that's the blue line, the one on the bottom. Okay. So there is no interaction term here. You could see that you get two parallel lines, but with the same slope, one for students and one for non-students. And you could see that you know the intercept is different between them. Okay. Right, so the students have more uh, credit card debt balance on average, say. Okay. So now, yes, no, yes. Okay, so now let's make this a function of, uh, let's, let's add a proper interaction term here. So same equation, but, uh, here, I vary uh, this uh, effect of being a student or not with income. So here, with this interaction term, you could see that the two regression lines have not only different intercepts, which we had already, but also different slopes. Okay. So this allows for the possibility that changes in income may affect the credit card balances of students and non-students differently. And so now how do you know, like let's say you're modeling something about your actual you know, problem and phenomenon, like how do you know when to do this and when not to do this? How do you know? Say that louder. Wouldn't you go based on the theory you have? You've got to have a theory, right? You can't just try all possible models until something sticks. I mean, you could, but that would be bad and would make me upset. <laughs> Nobody wants to make me upset. Um, so, you know, you have some theory, right, that describes the, uh, explains the phenomenon and the mechanisms, ideal and whatnot. And, you know, based off of that, you choose to model these um, you know, different slopes or not, et cetera, right? So you have some plausible mechanism that would justify this modeling choice. You don't just do it, okay? Uh, 
Jenny says that sometimes people compute a covariance matrix between the variables to determine whether we model interaction effects. Is that also viable? Let me take this offline because I don't know exactly what you mean. Is that okay, Jenny? Thanks, okay. All right, so now what we talked about so far is the basis. You will, if you figure this out and are comfortable doing this, if you become fluent in this, you will be invincible. Because fundamentally this, modeling approach will serve you forever no matter what questions you're answering right you know you'll still have to figure out the right model and whatnot and all kinds of things but if you figure out how to do this once you'll figure out how to do this forever so you'll be invisible uh, but it's not quite as straightforward as it seems so you know you have to be a little careful with how you're doing this there's all kinds of pitfalls you can fall into so let me show you a few First potential problem, there's some non-linearity of the data. We sort of started with this, the example we started from kind of hinted at this, but here's a better example maybe still, right? So uh, if you use a linear regression line to model this non-linear relationship between those two variables, like you're obviously you know, losing some resolution here. Like that's, you know, maybe a, a poor model of the actual relationship between the variables. Um, and one way to tell that it's poor is to look at these diagnostic plots, which you will also get for free in your favorite statistical software R. Uh, this one in particular is a plot of residuals on the y-axis versus fitted values, uh, estimated values on the x-axis. And you could see you know, that there's this clear uh, pattern to the residuals, to the errors. The residuals are whatever's left, right? Whatever you couldn't model. You can see there's this clear pattern and that would probably tell you that your model is not good enough to capture the data you started from. Okay? So ideally this residual plot will show no discernible pattern, it will look like a, a cloud of random noise. Okay. If there's any discernible pattern, you're probably doing something wrong with your original model. Okay. Uh, so here's what a residual, the residuals versus fitted plot looks like for a better model. Uh, so like here, you know, the model is a much closer, much more accurate representation of the data than in the previous example. Yes. What is the what did you use to get the red line on the residual? You get it for free. It comes for free. No, no, I just mean like, well, when I graph residual versus fit, I don't get the red one on there. Are you using your favorite statistical software R? Yes, I am. Oh. I just asked because that would be helpful because I have trouble looking at scatter plots and like actually interpreting them. Um, and so having a fitted line would be useful. You can use the plot. Uh, function and you give it the model object name. So you have some model, you know, M, right? You, you save that in an object in R, you know, M equals whatever, LM and blah, 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 blah. And then you say plot uh, parenthesis M. I guess what I'm asking is what model did you use to get the red one? <laughs> like, did you use like something that just fits in easy? I'm telling you this comes by default with the plot function. So whatever plot, when you plot a model object in R, whatever plot does internally to compute this is what this is. So the, the red line on the right. That's what I'm saying. Is, yes. Is not a plot of the model. No, the red line on the right is. Like what is, what is I like don't remember. <laughs> yeah, I don't remember that. It's a good, okay. good question. It's. Yeah, I don't remember that. Does anybody know over Zoom? What is the red line? You can ignore the red line, but uh, it, it looks like some sort of regression on the residual somehow almost. I don't know. I don't know what it is. Uh, 
ignore the red line for this exercise and just look at the points, the cloud of points. Okay. But I, I didn't do anything special is what I was trying to say. I, I just got this for free. You would get it too if you use the path function. Okay, so now here's the catch. I showed you these two models, okay, the, the one on the left hand side and the one on the right hand side. And if you look at the coefficient estimates for both of these, as well as the R squared goodness of fit values for both of these. I've highlighted all of those things in yellow. It's a little small, I'm sorry about that. You will hopefully notice that they are identical. So clearly very different data and relationships that result in indistinguishable, identical linear model estimates to the third decimal. That sounds bad, right? No? Why does it sound bad? I mean, it means we can't trust anything, right? Like, I mean, the first one makes sense. The second one, like, that doesn't make sense. So, you know, you were hoping maybe that this model, you know, these estimated coefficients and whatnot can be trusted by themselves. They cannot, is the point. So you got to do more work. Uh, so here, is so one way of dealing with this nonlinearity. You say, okay, so we have this nonlinearity. How might we deal with this? What might we do? This is another example, uh, less artificial this time. This is a real example. You have a linear regression. The left hand side is a linear regression of fuel consumption, you know, miles per gallon on horsepower. So, you know, how fuel efficient are bigger engines versus smaller engines, more powerful engines versus less powerful engines. Um, and you see this clear nonlinear relationship there. On the y-axis, you, sorry, uh, on the right-hand side, you have uh, another linear regression of fuel efficiency, except not just on horsepower, but also on the squared term of that. So I'm explicitly modeling this nonlinearity. I'm including a quadratic term right, to model this whatever, uh, I don't know, uh, the curve there. Okay, and you could see a much closer to ideal uh, plot of residuals. Right? The one on the right looks much more like a cloud of random points than the one on the left. But the one on the left has a much clearer pattern, which is bad. You want the residuals to look random. Okay. The one on the right is not perfect, but it's much better than the one on the left. So, so clearly here, you would conclude that the model including a quadratic term is a much better model for the data than the model without this quadratic term. Does that make sense? Okay, so now remember this example that we just talked about uh, a minute ago. Um, the residuals, again, would tell you, you know, which model to prefer. But so would the residuals would tell you that the model, the linear model for the uh, set of points on the right-hand side is not a great model because there's this clear pattern in the residuals. I said, by looking at this plot of residuals, you could tell if it's a good model or not. Uh, okay, here, this is another potential problem. So we talked about nonlinearity. This is different now. This is a problem, potential problem when the uh, error terms are correlated. So um, you see three sets of uh, points here. So three models. Um, this is a simulated time series data. Uh, simulated to have different levels of correlation between the error terms 
in adjacent time points. The idea here is we talked about regression to the mean a little bit last time, sort of similar idea. Like if you have, um, you know, if, if say the value of Bitcoin today is enormous or the value of Facebook stock today is enormous, you know, tomorrow is probably not going to tank entirely, right? Even if it falls or, or rises, it's going to be somewhat close to, you know, today's value. And the day after tomorrow is somewhat close to you know, tomorrow's value and so on. It's not going to have huge variations like that. So there's some correlation between adjacent points, right? It's not completely independent. Um, and you can simulate the effect of that on these regressions. Um, so you could see that when in the simulation, there is no uh, correlation between these adjacent uh, time points you could see a much nicer, much more random looking cloud of points here. And the more you increase this correlation between consecutive time points in the simulation, the more you see patterns in this residual plot, and that's something you want to avoid. Okay, so you know, if, if you have, if you end up with you know, a model that shows this pattern in your residual plots, you would question it. You would think that you know there's something you should do differently because it's probably not a great model, right? Because there's a lot of pattern in, in how the residuals are uh, how they they appear. Okay, here's another one. This is the one you asked about in the beginning, I think. You tell told me that you know there's more uh, variance uh, as you increase the value of the response. Um, and you see this here as well. So you see that, you know, towards the right-hand side here, the, the greater the fitted value, the more variance there is in the residuals, like the poorer you're doing at, at uh, modeling this. Um, so this is called, this is a symptom of something called a mouthful, you ready? Heteroscedasticity. I'll say it three times quickly. Okay, never mind. Um, but anyway, this, this is a technical term. It looks like this. You know, when you see it, it looks like this. You see this funnel in the residuals. Okay. The way to correct for this often is to apply some transformation to your data. In this case, I've logged the values to compress the range. So instead of modeling you know, y as a function of x, I'm modeling uh, the log of y as a function of x. That makes sense? That's the trick. That's how you fix it. Uh, OK, here's another potential problem. I'm going to talk about outliers and high leverage points. On the top left, you see one outlier, that guy on the top there. Okay, we call that an outlier point because it is very different from all the other ones. And you see in blue the estimated linear regression line. And the example on the right hand side, you see another outlier. Right, something that's very far from the rest of them. But in addition, we're going to call this one a high leverage point because it has high leverage, high influence on the estimated regression line. Because if I remove it, the estimated regression line on the right hand side is going to be a vertical through these points, very different from what I have now. The one on the right hand side is also an outlier, but maybe not so much a high leverage point, because even if I remove it, the estimated regression line is going to be very close to what it is now. It's going to go through the points there, which is not too far from what you're getting. So this is to say that not all outliers are bad. Outliers in general are bad with models, but some outliers are worse than others. The worst outliers are the ones with high leverage, more like the ones on the right hand side, right? That completely screw up your 
uh, regression estimates. You could also have friendly outliers that are more like the one on the left hand side, which you can tolerate. Okay. So now, you know, I, if you're, say, in a situation more like this one, you need to do something about this. Right? So typically, typically, you would remove these high leverage outliers. If you're able to identify them somehow, you would typically remove them. Because by definition, if they're outliers, they're rare. Okay. So, um, you know, you the 99.9% .9 of your data, right, would show some kind of relationship. And you have these few outliers that if kept in the data sets would completely um, screw up your interpretation of the relationship between those two variables, see? Okay? Okay, so typically you remove the outliers, right? So you lose something because you don't have now an understanding of the relationship between you know, your variables when it comes to those particular outliers, but you do have a much more precise, much more accurate understanding of the relationship for all the other ones. Okay, so you lose a bit on sample, but you gain a bit on precision on everything else. That makes sense? So by the way, so like this is another one of those things that people uh, often get wrong and uh, you know make me angry when I review papers and whatnot is that they did no uh, you know cleaning of their data and things like this, no attempts to uh, see if their models are robust to outliers, um, and you know you would conclude by the conclusions you draw from an analysis, right? If you do if you do no cleanup. Uh, would be very different from the conclusions that you would draw if you do do some cleanup, right? So you know, it's arguably invalid to draw this conclusion, right, about the relationship between your variables. Uh, so you do want to take these steps to, to account for this. So anyway, so there's more of these diagnostic plots that you could inspect to uh, tell if you need to deal with this or not, if this is a problem for you or not. Um, and again, all of these are available with the plot function that we talked about uh, a minute ago, just in R. Okay, so now what if I told you, remember the earlier example? What if I told you that these other two examples I just showed you result also in exactly the same coefficient estimates and exactly the same goodness of fit values? The regression lines for all four of these are all exactly the same. Do I have? I don't have. So this guy, this guy, this guy, plus the quadratic one we saw earlier, all have exactly the same regression line estimated. Isn't that annoying? Because it means that you can't just, you know, look at these coefficient estimates and stop, right? And, you know, write the paper. Right? Because you have to figure out if you can trust the model at all. Like you will always get some coefficient estimates, right? R, you know, does not discriminate. Will always give you estimates when you give it data. Doesn't really care. Um, but the question is, you know, can you trust the estimates or not? And that's where we have to do all this extra digging, and that's annoying. Uh, okay, here's another one. I promised I would get back to you on this, and I am finally doing this. So here is an extreme example of perfectly collinear data. Uh, by construction here, I've made x1 and x2 to be exactly the same variable. So you can see that they're exactly the same values. Uh, and I've made the outcome, y, to be perfectly modeled as the sum of the two. Okay, y as a, equals x1 plus x2. Okay. So now also note that you, know, you could model y as just two times x1 without any of x2. You could model y as you know three times x1 minus one time x2. You could model y in you know infinitely many ways as a function of x1 and x2 that would all be equally good models. Okay. So that's a problem. Again, right? Because you don't know, you know, which one is the right one. 
So the uh, symptoms of this is that the model you're estimating will have a hard time distinguishing between these uh, nearly equally plausible linear combinations of these collinear variables. Um, and you will see this in the super large standard errors that you will be getting for these coefficients. So now homework for Sam and everyone else is to try, especially for Sam, because he brought this up. I'm gonna, I'm gonna check on this. Is to try to you know copy this uh, data table, copy this whatever uh, table into R, and try to uh, estimate the simple regression model and see what you get in terms of standard errors on these coefficients and you know see how large they are when you have these collinear variables in there relative to when you don't okay and you can convince us next time that that this works um, oh yeah so there's also a trick here there's some one stop uh, function call you could apply it's called the variance inflation factor it's implemented in this library called car in r and you could you know, compute this and it would you know, it's a way of diagnosing whether or not you suffer from collinearity and if you do what do you do typically Remove the you... factor with the highest uh, variance inflation score. Courtney, yes, Courtney knows because she's been doing this. Um, so you know, if you get, say, uh, evidence that these two variables x one and x two are collinear, then that means they provide the same information, right? They're highly correlated. They provide the same information. Therefore. Uh, one of them is superfluous you can remove it right without losing any information because the other one that remains provides the same information right so that's how you fix it you fix it by pruning your model to keep only the variables you know only one instance of all of these highly correlated variables uh, and now if hungbauer here he'll tell you that this is a problem if these are variables for which you're actually testing research hypotheses, variables that you care about. If they're not variables that you care about, if they're just control variables for you know, plausible alternative explanations, but you don't actually care about them, you include them in your model to control for plausible alternative explanations, but you don't actually care about interpreting the coefficients that describe their relationship, then he would say that you don't care and you could just leave them be. Because you know, even if you get you know, inflated standard errors and whatnot, and you can't trust the coefficients, you don't care because you don't interpret the coefficients anyway. Uh, Hongbo is smart like that. But, you know, I think it's safe to always remove them because they don't provide any additional information. Certainly you should remove them when they are uh, meaningful to the study. Okay, so we're on time here. Let's... Uh, stop. I want you to think about these questions for uh, next time. Um, you know, how might you address these questions using this linear regression framework? You know, how, what might the linear model look like to address these questions if it were possible to use one to address these questions? So just something to think about for next time. The slides are already on the website, I think. I hope. Maybe. Maybe not. The slides will be shortly on the website. Okay. I'll see you on Tuesday.